Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining with us today. My wife and I are recording this sermon message in our living room and we want to share it with you today. The sermon title for today is The Transfiguration of Christ in Us. Transfiguration of Christ was like a vision, but it was also very real. Now that same transfiguration has been given to us in Christ, and it's been done in us in Christ. So before we go any further, I'd like to uh, say a prayer with you and ask for God's blessing and inspiration. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for sending Jesus to us. You came to us in Him to show us your love to us, and He did a marvelous job of doing that, and He uh, sealed the deal through His death and resurrection so that our sins would be paid for and we could be reconciled in relationship to you to be your children once again. We ask and pray, dear God, that as we are now transformed and transfigured in Christ in terms of in the Spirit, because once Pentecost came, you gave us that relationship with you that we are one in you. And we ask and pray, dear God, that you'll bless us and inspire us today. We thank you and ask this now in Jesus' holy and righteous name. And all together we say, Amen. Let us begin today by going to the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version. So if you have your Bible close to hand, would you uh, pick it up and turn to Luke, the ninth chapter. And we want to begin in verse 21. Luke 9, verse 21. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone, and he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples at this time. Verse 23, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wa wants to save their life and lose it will lose it, but whoever loses his life for, the, for me, he'll have life eternal. Because if we do it for Jesus, we'll save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man, will be ashamed of them when he comes in glory. Comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. And that's going to lead us up to the transfiguration on the mount. And that begins in verse 28. And about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. And they were talking to Jesus about the old covenant and about the glory it had. And it did have a certain glory, of course, it was of God, but it's not the same glory as the New Covenant has in the Spirit. Verse 31, they spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. So he's going to be going from the human ministry that he came down to do, to doing now the ministry in the Spirit, once he went back up to the Father to sit at his right hand. And Peter and his companions were very sleepy. Seems like they were always very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he was trying to show that he thought what was he, he was seeing was concerning the Feast of Tabernacles, which represented the kingdom of heaven on earth at, after Jesus' return in glory. But that isn't what he was showing. And so they 
they didn't understand because it says right after that he did not know what he was saying. See, uh, that's what it appeared to be, but that was with the old covenant understanding. He's showing something different, and it's like Jesus tabernacling with us uh, physically in his earthly ministry and also in the world to come, like the new covenant and then the world to come after that, the kingdom of heaven, we would be tabernacling, he would be tabernacling with us. We'd all be tabernacling together in the wonderful world tomorrow, or the kingdom of heaven. So, in verse 34, while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen, listen to him. And that is what we all need to do today. We all need to listen to him. As he was asking his disciples, the Father was asking his disciples to listen to him then. He just given them what they needed to know here about what was upcoming. Jesus dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. But they were not listening to him. Because when it happened, they ran. Because they weren't prepared for it. And he wants us all to be prepared for what's coming up now in the world. So when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. So the voice was from his Father in heaven. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. And of course, that's what Jesus had asked them to do, not to tell anyone. So, how does this apply to us today? Well, Jesus has done the same thing with us in the Spirit. You say, well, how is that so? Well, let's look at this that I'm going to bring up to you in the Spirit. How real is this to us in Ephesians, the first chapter? Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, what do we think when we hear that? That's too great for me. I, I don't understand. How does that happen? How does that look? Something like that. So Paul's going to explain that a little bit more, but it just gets deeper and deeper and more profound. Verse 4, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So he has now reconciled us, Christ has, because he's forgiven us our sins to our Heavenly Father so that we are his children today. Verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us, giving us way more grace than we could possibly imagine. And with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. And we're always trying to know exactly what that is today. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things. This is the reconciliation in heaven and on earth when under Christ. There's a transfiguration going on in there in the spirit. We have a hard time responding to that in the spirit because we, it's out of our territory of understanding. And we need to then pray to him that he would, Jesus would give us understanding in this with these scriptures. And we need to look Jesus in the face and look at his eyes and talk with him in prayer so we can understand how special we are to him, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Over in Ephesians 2 then, beginning in verse 4, it says this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ. Do you see that? That transfiguration? 
and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now that's more real than our being on the earth. Because in the Spirit, we're in heaven. Do you believe that? That's what it says. So that's a transfiguration. So how does that work? Well, it's a relationship with Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit that is ongoing every second of every day. And we either take advantage of that or, in other words, utilize it or, or not. If we decide to say, I want to look you in the eyes of Jesus and talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, well, we can. Or we don't have to. The choice is ours. The transfiguration is there. In verse 7, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So it's in the Spirit, it's a transfiguration of who God is in Christ, our Father and the Holy Spirit, and we are in a very, very close relationship. We are the children, the holy children of our Father today. So now let's go to John the 17th chapter. John 17 and verse 20. John 17 and verse 20. This is uh, Jesus' prayer to the Father before His crucifixion. My prayer is not for them alone, referring to His disciples at the day, at that time. I pray also for those who will believe in Me through their message. In other words, like we're supposed to give witness to the message of Jesus. Uh, they were to give that too. And... Uh, He's asked all of us to be his disciples today and to share our witness with people. In verse 21, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me, which is what John 3, 16 and 17 tell us. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one, as we are one, I and them, and you and me, and so that they may be brought to complete unity. So in other words, Jesus, Father, and the Holy Spirit would live in us, and we would live in them, and have their oneness that we would share with others. Then the world will know that you sent me, and you have loved them even as I have loved me. I mean, I didn't read that right. Let me read that correctly. And have loved them even as you have loved me. So in other words, the same kind of love that the Father gave to Jesus, He has given to us. The same love. No difference. The same amount of love. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. There's only one kind of love. It's the kind of love the Father gives to us. It's the kind of love the Father gives to His Son Jesus and to the Holy Spirit. We're all one in the Spirit. So that is a beautiful relationship. Absolutely gorgeous to behold. But what does this look like in our daily living? What's a good example of that? Well, let's go to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Now in the Beatitudes, which is Matthew 5, that's where we're going, Matthew 5, verse 43, in the Beatitudes, it's talking about how Jesus' relationship is with the Father and with us. It's the same. He treats His Father the, the same, the same respect and love, and He treats us with love and respect too. There's no variation in the way God approaches everything and everybody in relationship. So, when you get to more the end of the Beatitudes, we see a, a practical application here about our being sons and daughters of our Father. Matthew 5 and verse 43, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And that's, of course, what Jesus was doing with the people he was ministering to. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. See, that's the way the children of our Father in heaven 
respond. So if we're being, uh, you know, attacked in some way, or being persecuted by our enemy, well, this is the way that you would handle that as a child of God. He causes him, his son to rise on the evil and the good. So he treats everybody the same in that way. Sins reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. No difference there either. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? You don't even pagans do that. So be perfect. In other words, we've been given the righteousness of Jesus. He's attributed that to us. Therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect, so we can be perfect today because of Jesus. And we can be His children because of Jesus. And we can be uh, ministers of His reconciliation because of Jesus. And so here we are today uh, reaping the rewards of what Jesus has done for us in the Spirit. We are also transformed or transfigured to be the ministers of Christ's reconciliation and the ambassadors of His kingdom of light. Over in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, we see that. Let's pick it up now in verse um, 16. So now that we are in the Spirit, in Christ, uh, because He's given us the Holy Spirit to indwell us, verse 16, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, but from a spiritual point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So our Father reconciled us to himself through Christ through his death and resurrection and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Our Father has given us that in Christ, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. So if we wonder why we're not hearing more of true reconciliation in the world, well, we ought to ask ourselves the question, why am I not being a witness to that, as it says here in 2 Corinthians 5? I guess it begins with us. It's been committed to us, so if we don't speak it, it doesn't get spoken. So we are therefore, in verse 20, Christ ambassadors, though God were making his appeal through us, and he is. He wants us to use our voice to speak about how we have been reconciled to our Father and we are now His children today. Someone has to speak it. So God is waiting for us to do that. And when we do, we're therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's what the world needs now. We see it between Russia and Ukraine and other nations. They need to be reconciled with each other, and they're not. And they're killing each other. That's what happens with a lack of reconciliation in the world. So our Father shows us His Son Jesus, which He has done, and He asks us to join with Him in His ministry of reconciliation in the Spirit we are prepared for this now, today. So when Jesus, when Jesus returns in glory, it will be more than a transfiguration. It will be a reality in the Spirit. In 1 John 3, 1 John 3 and verse 1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Do you see that, brethren? He's lavished His love on us. Do you feel that, that transformation, that transfiguration in the Spirit? That we should be called children of God. Amazing. Wonderful. And what is, and that is what we are. That is our current reality today. 
The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him, Jesus. And that's still the world's problem today. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears in glory, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And the only reason we'll be able to see Him as He is in glory is because we will have a glorified body too at that time in history coming up. Because we'll meet Him in the air when He's coming down from heaven in glory. And we'll meet Him there and come down with Him to the earth in a glorified, resurrected body. And we will be on the earth with Him. We will be partaking of the Supper of the Lamb. We will begin to be a part of that New Jerusalem with Jesus in the wonderful world tomorrow and the kingdom of heaven on earth. So now let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Talking about the resurrection of us. To have a glorified spiritual body. A glorified spiritual body. No more aches or pains or crying or distress. We will be with Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, the new kingdom on earth. The, heaven, the new heaven and new earth. We will be there with him. What a wonderful thought and a realization. That's coming. You can almost begin to feel it, can't you? I certainly can. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah! Amen. That's what we're looking for. But we have a time yet to do what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to do His ministry of reconciliation in all the world. That shows it's what He did on the cross and the resurrection from the dead that have forgiven our sins and reconciled us to our Father and we are His children reaching out to our brothers and sisters who do not know Jesus yet. And it continues in verse 55. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So my brothers and sisters, I plead with you to be the ministers of Christ's reconciliation. We all need to be in the army of God around the world. We all need to come together and be one in Him as we are in the Spirit. We all need to be about our Father's business. And He has said, go and be a part of my Son Jesus' ministry of reconciliation for the time is near the glory of jesus is returning we have to prepare the world for his return so that as many as our brothers and sisters as possible can say yes lord yes and let us pray thank you dear god thank you dear lord jesus please bless us with your spirit today and our spiritual understanding Help us to see the transfiguration and the spirit that you've given to us because we are a new creation. Help us to keep our eyes on you, Jesus, so that we can walk on the water of life knowing that you will help us do that like you did Peter. Dear God, but as soon as Peter was distracted by the waves and the wind, 
down he went. So help us not to be distracted by the things of the world so that we can continue to walk in the miracle of your transfiguration in us. We thank you. We ask your blessing today and your protection from Satan and his demons. It's in the mighty and powerful name of you, Jesus, that we pray. And all together we say, Amen.